Hello everyone and welcome to Worship with Warwick Anglican Parish. Today is Sunday the 9th of August and we are worshipping offline around the parish at St Mark's, half past eight in Warwick or Christ Church Kalani at eight o'clock. The Lord be with you. We have three Bible passages that you might like to now take your time with. Those passages are Genesis 37, 1 to 4 and 12 to 28, the account of Joseph being sold into slavery. The second one is from the first book of Kings, chapter 19, 9 to 18. And that's the account of Elisha and the still small voice. And our gospel today is Matthew's gospel 14, 22 to 33, which is the account of Jesus walking on the water. Our two hymn choices today are Amazing Grace and also, finally, How Deep the Father's Love for Us. So we'll have links to those two songs and the passages printed on our Facebook feed. Let's make a beginning with our reflection. In the name of God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit. A long, a long time ago, when I was a little girl and my brother Mark was about three or four, we went to a confirmation service. And we didn't get out much, as you'll appreciate. And this service was big and bright and well lit in a church at night. It was marvellous to watch the procession of people, servers and crucifers and acolytes. And then right up the back was a very impressive looking figure. He was imposing, he was regal, he had a jewelled mitre and cope and he carried a fine crozier. My little brother got tremendously excited. Look mummy, look, he said, his voice carried across the music. There's God, can you see him over there? He was desperate for her to see what he could see. There's God. He'd actually located the right Reverend Ralph Wicks in all his splendor but he was convinced that he had found God. Finding God is right at the heart of all these three readings today. The people in each account are themselves in places of uncertainty, anguish or terror. Whether they're down a dry well or in the wilderness surrounded by earthquake, wind and fire or drowning in a stormy lake, they want to understand where God might be found in their distress. And that too is the question at the heart of our theme today as we look at the issue of human trafficking. Today, a little bit belated, we mark the anniversary of the death of William Wilberforce. William Wilberforce had been the energy behind the significant social justice movement across Great Britain to abolish the slave trade in the 19th century. It was an inchingly slow process and those in favour of the human slave trade quoted scripture as much as those who opposed it. But through dogged effort, legal loopholes and his own faithful conviction that all were created in the image of God regardless of colour, the slave trade from Africa to Britain and her colonies ceased. It took longer to wrestle the question into submission in the United States through the progress of the Civil War. But bit by bit, trading humans has become unacceptable and abhorrent. It demeans us as humans, selling humans, as if another life was ours to dispose of or profit from. Yet it's exactly what is done in Genesis 37. Joseph, the boastful dreamer, his father Jacob, or Israel's favorite son, is grabbed by his jealous brothers and thrown into a, a pit or a dry well. They discuss whether they should kill him. But in the end, it's Judah who suggests that they could stand to make a profit if they sold the wretch. And so they do. And thereafter follows a dark chapter in Joseph's hitherto privileged life. He is enslaved. And then he's accused falsely, imprisoned and forgotten. Far away, his father is told that he is dead. And after a while, I think it's a story his brothers accept. Stuck in the shadows, his dreams are vain and distant memory. Where is God in the long silence of Joseph's enslavement 
and imprisonment. Where is God in that prison cell? While Joseph's not a terribly likeable figure, his vanity and his lack of tact contribute to his own downfall. Nothing justifies the actions of his brothers in selling their own flesh and blood. The world is so full of injustice, selfishness, cruelty and greed seem to beset us. If God is love, we might ask, then why do we not see more love and less hatred? Why are people marginalised and stolen and enslaved? Where might we find God? Why isn't God more obvious? One gets the feeling that these are the unspoken questions at the centre of Elisha's passionate response in the One Kings passage today. It's so vitally important that he offers it twice, identically worded, in answer to a question from God, what are you doing? And he says, I have been very zealous for the Lord, the God of hosts, for the Israelites have forsaken your covenant. They have thrown down your altars and killed your prophets with the sword. I alone am left and they are seeking my life to take it away. Elisha's response implies, what am I doing? What are you doing? I am alone. I am afraid. My life is in danger. Yet to Elisha's litany, God makes no immediate response. So where is God? Because he is not in the upheaval of an earthquake, nor the power of a great wind, nor the terror of a fire. The work of William Wilberforce and his allies did not abolish slavery. He began to stem the tide. He and those like him raised our consciousness when we preferred the dull ease of an unquestioning life. The tragedy is that we are painfully slow learners. Human trafficking of men, women and children as cannon fodder, sweatshop labour, food production or domestic usage, or for the sex trade, these things have not diminished. It represents one of the biggest black market industries in the world to this day. Exact figures are hard to come by, but some sources estimate between 40 and 45 million are in slavery. And this doesn't include the international labour organisation figures on children in hard labour, which is a much higher figure, 152 million. Slavery exists in Australia. The A21 Group, a prominent anti-slavery charity, estimates that the industry is worth globally $198 billion every year. From earlier stories, we see humanity's fallen and selfish nature, from Cain and Abel, to Joseph, stuck in a lightless, loveless place, to Elisha, looking for God's justice amid mass slaughter and manifest injustice. These things are what we call sin. Forgetful of God, subduing our better angels and falling sway to the earthquakes, winds and fires of our own insecurity or our desire for power. Our mercenary streak runs deep and hard and cold and calculating. We are little better in, than Judah, selling others for a profit or turning a blind eye like the other voiceless brothers in the story today. So where is God to be found? Far less, I think, in the pomp and ceremony than we imagine, and not at all in the loud and destructive forces that circle us round. But there, as Elisha finds in the still, small voice, in the outreaching hand on a stormy night, among the compassionate advocacy and action of those brave people whose work shines a light in the darkness, in the actions of UNICEF, the ILO, the A21 campaign, the Freedom Project, Stop the Traffic, and Christian organisations like Destiny's Rescue and Zoe. There are those who faithfully and courageously step out in our world to rescue and restore. And I would warmly encourage you to look at the sites that you see on the hard copy of the sermon and explore those links some more and act as you see fit. Poverty and desperation weigh very heavily on one side of slavery's ledger and on the other side there is profiteering, control and deception. Do we know who makes our cheap clothes or our bargain basement products? 
Are we aware of how many people are trafficked from Southeast Asia into Australia for the sex trade? If we work to eliminate poverty, if we educate our children and young people, and if we permit the truth of the Imago Day to flourish in those around us, how much might we change? Does humanity sink or swim? Are we swamped, overwhelmed by the chaos and the storm? The Bible today presents us with three stories of human frailty and reminds us that paradox runs deep within our faith. We are made in God's image and saved by God's grace and yet we never find God where we might expect. By and by, Joseph is lifted up out of prison and into the court of a king where he helps to save a nation. God is in a still, small voice assuring Elisha that he is seen and that justice will come. And God incarnate is on those stormy seas with Peter. To this day, he walks without fear towards the boats of our own existence, thrown about in tempests of injustice or cruelty and always reaching out a hand to pull us up from the merciless water. My brother thought he had found God that night at St Stephen's Cooperoo, but God isn't found in the way we might dress things up, the way things appear in our outer life, but in the quality of our inner life, our capacity for hope and faith and the way in which we love. William Wilberforce shone a light on terrible injustice. We can take up the torch and in doing so, find that God's loving action is where we do not think to look in our own frailty.